Hi everybody, it's December 2012 and this is the Blood Bank Guy video podcast. My name is Joe Chaffin, I'm super glad that you're here. Today we're going to talk about transfusion reactions. We've got a lot of stuff to cover, limited amount of time to do it, so let's get rolling. So before we get into the actual details of the specific transfusion reactions, there's one thing I just wanted to make sure you were aware of, and that's this. Um, the handout, which I prepared for the November 2012 version of this podcast, which was actually part one, uh, and went over the reaction workup, is somewhat out of date now. So if you downloaded the handout previously, uh, please go back to the Blood Bank Guy website. You can go to either no the November or December 2012 podcast page. Just make sure that the handout that you have looks like this at the top, that it says November, December 2012, and that'll get you the most up-to-date version of the handout. Okay, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a quick look first at uh, a review of the, what we talked about last time, the workup and the details of the workup. Then we'll talk about how we categorize reactions. That'll be somewhat review last, from the last time as well. And then we'll go over the specific details, a lot of details actually, about multiple different transfusion reactions. If you watched the last month's podcast, the, the November 2012 podcast, this figure should be fairly familiar to you. And it's basically the way that I look at doing transfusion reactions. And I, I essentially break these tests down into tier one tests, which include first, of course, stopping the transfusion, doing a clerical check, and checking for hemoglobinemia, the DAT or direct Coombs test and repeating the ABO and RH testing. And then only if, if you're suspicious, moving on to the tier two tests that include the tests that you see down there at the bottom. And we're gonna talk about some of these tests as we go along, in particular as we talk about the acute hemolytic reaction, but I really wanna make sure that you are clear on what we're talking about with uh, when we talk about doing a transfusion reaction workup. If you need more details than that, if you have not done the November 2012 podcast, I think it would be a, a reasonable way for you to spend a half hour Hour to go and check that out before you come back um, and do this portion of the podcast. In the last version in November 2012, again, we talked about the way that I categorize transfusion reactions, and I really do it fairly simply, I think anyway. Um, I break them down into two categories. The first category is the ones that present with a fever, or the febrile transfusion reactions, and those can be either acute, meaning they occur during the transfusion or within the first 24 hours afterward, or delayed, obviously meaning that they occur more than 24 hours afterward. And on the other hand, of course, we have the afebrile transfusion reactions, those that present typically without fever, again, either acute or delayed. We're gonna use that framework to go over the reactions here in just a minute. Um, in addition, I should call your attention to the fact that the CDC has tried very carefully and very specifically to define transfusion reactions in a way that we really haven't had access to before. Um, this is a publication from the CDC, which is the National Healthcare Safety Network Manual, specifically regarding biovigilance or hemovigilance, as it's also called. This particular version was from June 2011. A lot of details in here about transfusion reactions. People aren't necessarily bound to use their definitions, which here's an example of their definition from the appendix of that uh, document that I just showed you. Uh, but I think that it's important to understand that there is a, a national movement in the United States to standardize the way, the, the way that we look at these things. Um, and while I don't use all of their definitive, non-definitive, et cetera, criteria and severity that you'll see in, these, in the appendices, uh, I, I think it's important that you have a handle on the fact that that is happening and in the future we may be somewhat more standardized than we are now. If you're interested in downloading this, the, website, the web address is up at the top right. Okay, with no further ado, let's go in and let's talk specifically about the acute febrile transfusion reactions up in the top left of this uh, diagram and we will start, of course, first with the most important transfusion reaction of all and that's the acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. Acute hemolytic reactions are really a blood banker's worst nightmare. They're the things that we worry about the most, the things that we work on the most to try and prevent. They are the potentially catastrophic destruction of incompatible red cells, basically. Um, they have a, a, a reasonable incidence, one in 76,000, which is somewhat of a scary number, but in truth, only about one in 1. 1.8 million transfusions actually result in a fatal acute hemolytic reaction. Most of these happen as a result of clerical errors, someone screwing up basically, someone drawing the wrong person, writing the wrong name, either at the bedside 60% or in the blood bank obviously another 40%. We've gotten a lot better at preventing these. If you look at this slide, you'll see this is the, this is the number of fatal acute hemolytic reactions reported to the FDA since 2001, and you can see the trend line is pretty definitively down. 
Also, this figure from uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine in, in March of this year shows, uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective, and there's the fatal acute hemolysis, that's the one in 1 1.8 million number that I quoted to you earlier, it's about the same risk as getting HIV or hepatitis C from a transfusion ballpark. Um, and uh, around the range of getting, of dying in an airplane crash or being struck by lightning. Um, so again, not incredibly common, but we worry about it a lot because they are generally preventable. So how do these guys present? Patients with acute hemolytic reactions, you can see in the chart on the, the picture, I should say, on the right, there's a lot of things there. That, but the thing that I want to really call your attention to, so important to remember this. In fact, if you don't remember anything else about the acute hemolytic reaction presentation, please remember this. And that's that at the point where you can make a difference, which is early in the presentation of acute hemolysis, 80%, according to some studies of these reactions, present with fever and chills alone. Nothing else. None of this other stuff that we typically associate with acute hemolytic reactions, including the pain at the infusion, pain or heat at the infusion site, or flank pain or constricting chest pain, hypotension and shock, uh, patients who are anesthetized in particular having unexplained bleeding or DIC or hemoglobinuria, and my favorite, which you probably know from the last time, the sense of impending doom. Um, all those things can certainly happen, but most acute hemolytic reactions present early with just fever and chills. So please don't ignore those. Please consider that when you see someone who has a fever. And speaking of fever, um, the timing of the temperature increase is important. If you notice on this chart here, uh, you can see that a significant proportion of patients with getting a red cell transfusion who have an acute hemolytic reaction have an elevated temperature within the first 15 minutes. Very important to recognize and if you're a transfusing nurse, you should definitely be aware of this and understand this is the reason that we bug you about transfusing slowly in the first 15 minutes because these reactions can present early. Well, what about in the laboratory? When we're doing our workup, uh, the things that the diagram that I showed you before, what comes up positive? Well, typically in acute hemolytic reaction, you will see visible hemoglobinemia. In other words, you take a post-transfusion sample, you centrifuge it, and you can see that the plasma has turned red. Uh, but that generally goes away in a matter of hours if the patient has adequate renal function. Hemoglobinuria, in other words, looking at the urine and seeing visible hemoglobin in the urine or testing it for hemoglobin, that goes away a little later and it, it presents a little later. Um, typically, it's gone in about a day or so. The direct Coombs or the direct antiglobulin test will be positive unless, very important unless, you will get a false negative direct Coombs if you wait too long to do the, the transfusion reaction workup. So if the red cells have already been destroyed, the incompatible red cells, then obviously the DAT would be negative. Bilirubin goes up, and if the patient goes into DIC, you'll see things like D-dimers and fibrin split products. Also important to note that the, there are findings on the peripheral smear. If you have a typical acute hemolytic reaction, the one that we'll describe in a minute, that's intravascular, I'll describe that further momentarily, you will typically see, I said a lot of typical there, you will typically see schistocytes blown apart red cells indicated by the arrows here in this picture. Extravascular hemolysis, on the other hand, where the hemolysis occurs actually outside of uh, the, the bloodstream in the, in the reticuloendothelial system specifically, you will see spherocytes more commonly. So fairly typical findings on the peripheral smear. Well, what about the antibodies? What, what are we talking about when we talk about acute hemolytic reactions? Well, I think most everyone knows that the big thing that we worry about with acute HTRs is ABO incompatibility. And we do so much work to try and prevent ABO incompatibility. And if you look at this diagram, which is from the FDA, you see from in the last five years, from fiscal year 2007 through 2011, yeah, that's five, two, seven, eight, nine, yeah, okay, uh, that roughly half of the fatal acute hemolytic reactions were from ABO incompatibility. But but a significant number of other reactions occur uh, from other antibodies that may more typically give extravascular hemolysis. Well, keep that in mind, but please understand that our, when we describe acute hemolytic reactions, we typically describe them in the context of the acute intravascular hemolysis that results most classically from ABO incompatibility. And here's how that looks. Just, just remember that it does not take much for an acute hemolytic reaction to happen. As little as 10 cc's where antibodies are fixing complement, IgM doing that better than IgG, the red cells blown apart in the vessels, and you have a significant number of other consequences. It's basically a perfect storm. Here's how, the, here's how it looks graphically, and I love this image. Um, the the, the uh, sighting that you see at the bottom, 2006 Pearson Education, is the best sighting that I could find. Uh, please forgive me if this belongs to someone else, but this is the best I could find. Here's 
here's a classic ABO hemolytic reaction. A patient is type A, so as a result, they have A antigen on their red cells, anti-B in their plasma. They get a transfusion, generally accidentally, from someone who has who's blood group B. Um, the blood group B individuals obviously have B antigen on the surface. As a result, antibodies bind, complement is fixed. The complement uh, causes the formation of membrane attack complexes that punches holes in the membrane itself, and you get the red cell blowing apart and intravascular hemolysis, as we, as we described earlier. This is a very, very significant situation, and it leads to a multitude of consequences, including things in the inflammatory systems, coagulation system, circulatory system, renal, respiratory, etc. There's a lot of consequences that we'll talk about here in just a sec. And so what does that storm look like? Oh, well, in addition, I should mention this, that you get generation of a multitude of cytokines, including uh, substances from complement like C3A and C5A, which aren't really cytokines, forgive me, but also a number of cytokines that are described on this next slide. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1, beta, IL-6, IL-8. Uh, those cytokines have significant consequences that we'll talk about in just a second. Obviously, in intravascular hemolysis, you have uh, the free hemoglobin being loosed into the circulation. We talked about that a little bit the previous time, but not just hemoglobin. Hemoglobin-free red cell stroma has some direct toxic effects, and some other substances like bradykinin can cause issues. Let's go through some of these systems one by one. Inflammatory-wise, well, some of those cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 beta, and interleukin-6 are very strongly pyrogenic, and that term means that they cause fever. Uh, so fever, as we said before, is one of the cardinal findings in a patient with an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. In addition, all of those stimulate white cells to, to having increased activity, and interleukin-8 does that as well. And that increased activity can have multiple consequences, some of which we'll talk about in the next few slides. As far as coagulation goes, it's very complex, this whole interaction is, and, and I will just summarize it this way. There's a lot more to it than this. Certainly, the formation of antigen-antibody complexes from incompatible red cell transfusion activates factor 12. Coagulation factor 12 starts you down the intrinsic coagulation pathway. However, complement and cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha activate tissue factor, which starts you down the extrinsic pathway. Let me show you this. It's easier to show you than it is to, to tell you. And, uh, uh, on the left side, we see antigen-antibody complexes stimulating the intrinsic coagulation cascade. Uh, on, the, on the right side, we have complement and cytokines stimulating the extrinsic pathway. Basically, as you can see, you get stimulation of coagulation. But in addition, those processes, because coagulation is way more complex than this simple image shows, you also get stimulation of the fibrinolytic pathways. So if you're stimulating coagulation and fibrinolysis, it shouldn't surprise you that at least 10% of patients with acute hemolytic reactions go into disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. Next, we have circulatory consequences. And again, these are multi there are multiple ones here, and they are complicated. Um, nitric oxide generation from C3A and C5A, as well as some of the cytokines. Well, nitric oxide, when present, leads to vasodilation. Bradykinin, also from the activation of the intrinsic coagulation system, is a short-acting vasodilator. So as a result, you can have significant hypotension and shock very quickly. And these patients can go into systemic, systemic collapse very rapidly. Um, more on the pulmonary edema thing in just a moment. As far as renal consequences, well, renal consequences are what we've worried about for years with acute hemolysis. It was thought previously that patients with acute hemolytic anemia, that the pathophysiology was fairly simple. Hemoglobin went, trashed the kidneys, and the patients had acute renal failure as a result. Turns out that doesn't actually happen all that often. It's a lot more complicated than that. Well, as a consequence of the systemic hypotension, well, you get a, a compensatory systemic, or sorry, sympathetic vasoconstriction that somewhat selectively vasoconstricts the renal vessels, as you see there. So you get a decreased amount of blood flow to the kidneys. And in addition, free hemoglobin can, can scavenge nitric oxide, at least locally, in the renal vasculature, which also leads to vasoconstriction in the kidneys. So you get decreased blood flow to the kidneys. But in addition, out in the, the renal parenchyma, you have microthrombi being formed as a result of the DIC that's happening. The free red cell stroma can directly damage the renal tissue. Bottom line, you get an issue with blood flow and it leads to acute tubular necrosis and oliguric renal failure in one-third of patients at least. Um, a very big and significant issue.
Well, as far as treatment of these things, again, historically, we what we've always said is the, the keystones to treatment are hydration and diuresis. In other words, we want to give them fluids to make sure they have an adequate amount of fluid to keep their renal blood flow going and diuresis to make sure that their urine output stays at least one milligram one milliliter per kilogram per hour. You may need Lasix to do that. The problem with all that is that if a patient goes into oliguric renal failure and we're still slamming them with, uh, with fluids basically, then they run the risk of fluid overload and pulmonary edema fairly rapidly. So that is a big potential problem. Um, some other possibilities, if a patient is early in DIC, the, the use of heparin has been advocated, it's controversial, and the use of early red cell exchange, again, before someone crashes, is possible to get out the incompatible red cells, but that's not done all that commonly. Acute HTRs are essentially prevented by paying close attention, bottom line. Uh, phlebotomy, labeling, processing, issuing, administration, all that has to be done with an eye towards being extraordinarily careful towards the patient getting the right unit that's intended for them. Some people do this in different ways and you see some possibilities there. We won't take the time to go into it, but that's the bottom line. Make everybody, when everyone is taking the time to do the right thing, most acute hemoly hemolytic reactions, not all, but most can be prevented. Okay, let's move on to febrile reactions. We certainly could talk more about acute, hemo acute hemolytic reactions, but we need to move along and talk about the febrile reaction. These are reactions that we're seeing considerably less of nowadays. 1% uh, historically of transfusions, certainly higher in platelet transfusions, uh, but now we see it in closer to 0.1 to maybe a little higher than that in platelet transfusions. Basically, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. In other words, a patient who has an unexplained one degree Celsius or two degree Fahrenheit elevation in temperature is said to have had a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. That's not a definitive threshold, by the way. Someone gets to 1.9 degrees Fahrenheit, it's the same pathophysiology, so don't get all alarmed about it. So why does it happen? Well, febrile reactions happen very simply because a patient has increased pyrogenic cytokines and substances. That's, that's it. Those, those pyrogenic, fever-inducing cytokines and substances can either come from the white cells, such as tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-1 beta, IL-6, or from platelets themselves, such as soluble CD40 ligand. Now let's take a look at how this works and hang with me for just a second. We're going to build a little bit of, of a pathophysiologic tree. Okay, again, the bottom line is that if you have those substances on the bottom, you're going to have fever. Well, that you can get to that in one of two main different ways. And the first is characterized by the, the, the type of febrile reaction that most commonly occurs with platelet transfusion. So if you get a platelet transfusion, you should be well aware that platelet trans, platelet concentrates, whether they're apheresis or whole blood derived, typically, unless something is done to them, will have a decent amount of lymphocytes. And those lymphocytes, or white cells in general in there, they're not necessarily the happiest white cells. They're sitting there, the platelets are, platelets are kept at warm temperatures, 20 to 24 degrees. They're agitating, they're kind of looking around, and they look around at that, that foreign environment that they're in, basically, and guess what? They're not too terribly happy. Those lymphocytes, when they're in that type of an environment, they do the things that white cells do, which is they start cranking out cytokines. So the substance are, substances are actually generated in the bag prior to the transfusion, so that when the transfusion happens and the blood, the, pa the platelets, I should say, go into the patient, the substances are already there, they go in and they cause fever. Okay, so that's classically the way that those reactions occur with platelets. On the other hand, with red cells, Again, red cells, unless you do something to them, have a lot of white cells present along with the red cells. And those red cell, the, sorry, the, the, the white cells there in, red, in the red cell units are a little bit different than the white cells in platelets. Because remember, red cells are stored at cold temperatures, one to, one to six degrees. It's kind of cold in there. The white cells are not really particularly active. They're not agitating around like they are with platelets. And so they're a little bit sleepy. And so they tend not to secrete cytokines in the bag. On the other hand, they tend to have interactions once the transfusion occurs. So once you get into the recipient, remember the recipient has some things going on too. The recipient has his own, his or her own white cells. And depending on what's happened with the recipient, the recipient may have some antibodies that are incompatible with the transfused white cells. So what can happen is an interaction with these transfused white cells that can go one of a couple ways. Either the patient's antibodies, the recipient's antibodies, can interact with the transfused white cells, uh, and damage them or stimulate them to, stim to, to secrete cytokines, 
or the recipient's own white cells as a result of just being transfused can develop some of these or se can secrete some of these pyrogenic substances and in the end we end up with the same sort of scenario but please notice that the substances are actually generated in this model after the transfusion we'll come back to that in just a second Okay, so the signs and symptoms by definition are just fever and chills. If the, if the fever and chills occur very early, your main differential should be sepsis, but they don't typically. They are much more commonly later in the transfusion. Uh, it's also common to have some different variants where if the patient has a head injury or has been premedicated, they may get chills only and not get a temperature elevation. One thing that I like to point out is that they, these patients usually do not get true shaking chills, rigors. They usually get more mild chills and and there's some there is some interpretation there obviously but a severe the bed is rattling with their with their chills type of rigors those are really more commonly associated with septic transfusion reactions that we'll talk about in a minute and we do that when we do the lab work they, it lab workup excuse me it is negative by definition notice by comparison to the acute hemolytic reaction with red cells at least and certainly even more so with platelets the rea the fever tends to occur much later later in the transfusion. We'll, we'll see more on that in just a second. As far as the differential, we've mentioned this already. We always think about acute hemolysis. Um, however, acute hemolysis, the fever is usually earlier. However, there is so much overlap, as I mentioned previously, that you can't rule it out just as a result of the patient only having fever and chills. And transfusion-related sepsis likely, is, is likely to present considerably earlier, like we'll talk about before, talk about later, excuse me, especially with red cell, red cell sepsis. We manage these patients fairly simply by stopping the transfusion, doing a workup, giving them, once the workup is negative, giving them an antipyretic if necessary. Uh, some people do pre-medication, but it's been pretty clearly shown that that's not a real effective strategy, at least to do in all patients. And in some patients who have severe chills, they may have to get Demerol or Meperidine. Okay, so let's go back to, to what we were talking about before and remember, uh, this happens, these reactions happen as a result of the pyrogenic cytokines uh, that cause fever. So how do we get, how do we keep this from happening? Well, the way we keep it from happening essentially is to get these white cells out of the transfused substances. That's the best way to do it. When we talk about platelets, and let's look up here on the, the top left, we got to get the, plate, the white cells out of the platelet bag before the product is stored for significant periods of time. So we do that with what we call pre-storage leukocyte reduction. We get the white cells out very early in the, in the storage life, the shelf life of the product, so that they don't have a chance to get angry and secrete cytokines. On the other hand, on the right, when do we get the, the white cells out of the red cell units? Well, really, it hardly matters. You can do it pre-storage, uh, like we do with platelets typically, or you can do it immediately prior to the transfusion, best to do that in the transfusion service. But honestly, leukocyte reduction done on a pre-storage manner will prevent, generally speaking, the vast majority of both of these types of transfusion, uh, transfusion reactions. So that's what most places do, and that's fairly universal in the United States and in most places in the world today. Okay, let's move along. Let's talk about transfusion-related sepsis, which is the number one infectious risk from transfusion today. That's a big deal. Um, it, much, much more common than any of the any of the different viruses that cause significant disease that we that we've talked about in previous podcasts. It's been stated that one in three thousand platelet units are contaminated, and that may well be true. Some studies seem to indicate that, but the truth is that most of them do not cause reactions, despite the fact that they may be contaminated. Most most of them don't cause reactions. Um, well, how, how does it happen? Well, it can happen as a result of skin contaminants, most commonly with platelets. With red cells, it's more commonly the donor having organisms in their blood, and you'd be surprised how common subclinical sepsis is. In other words, a patient that has a bug running around in their bloodstream and they just don't know about it and they don't have symptoms. In plasma products, they are very uncommonly contaminated. There have been some reports of outbreaks in, in contaminated water baths, but that's a topic for another day. What kind of bugs are we talking about? Well, typically with red cells, red cells tend to be contaminated by gram-negative rods, like Yersinia and E. coli, and you see the list there. I'm not a microbiologist by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know enough about these to know that these are bugs that like to live in cold temperatures and like to live in an iron-rich environment, which obviously a red cell would be a perfect medium for them. Also, most of these are capable of secreting endotoxin, which causes significant clinical effects. 
Platelets, on the other hand, tend to be contaminated by gram-positives, especially gram-positive cocci like skin contaminants because, remember, they're stored differently. Platelets are stored at 20 to 24, um, and gram-positives like to grow in that, those temperatures. You can get gram-negative rod contamination, however, of platelets, and those are the ones, because of the endotoxin, that tend to cause fatalities most commonly. Most platelets that are contaminated by gram-positives do not lead to fatality. Okay, well, what kind of bugs are we talking about in terms of causing the fatalities? And I just mentioned that. The ironic thing about this is that if you look from, from two, fiscal year 2007 through fiscal year 2011, actually the number one organism causing fatality is Babesia. It's not even a bacteria at all. So we're not going to talk about Babesia today. That's totally a topic for another day. But if you look, you see a list of some of those organisms that, we've, that we described earlier, uh, some of those bacterial organisms. Um, again, FDA data showing that red cells can cause fatality from sepsis, platelets can as well, and most of the platelets that, are, that cause fatality were contaminated by gram negatives. So how do these present? Transfusion-related sepsis has a very classic presentation, especially with red cell, red cell sepsis, and it's basically the endotoxin effect. They have a rapid onset of a super high fever. They go from normal to super high fever in a very short period of time. They do get rigors, the true honest-to-God shaking chills, abdominal complaints, shock, and DIC fairly rapidly. Basically, it's septic shock. Um, and if you, look at the, if you look at the timing of the reaction, again, when we're talking about red cells, it occurs very early in the transfusion. In fact, um, it is one of the th things that co contributes to what I call the, the acute crash in transfusion. Acute crashes occur either as a result of sepsis, most commonly, or anaphylaxis, also possible but not necessarily likely, um, and acute hemolytic transfusion reactions. We'll talk about how to get how to distinguish those shortly. Okay, well, let's talk about it now a little bit. In terms of the acute hemolytic reactions, they tend to actually present a little bit later, and they don't tend to present quite as severe as sepsis, but you certainly can't rule it out in a patient who has an acute crash. And the anaphylactic reaction, on the other hand, is generally an afebrile reaction, and most anaphylactic anaphylactic reactions will have skin findings such as hives and or diffuse redness, which we'll talk about later. Fairball non-hemolytic reactions with platelet contamination can be identical. You may not be able to tell them apart. And a patient can always be septic for another reason other than the transfusion. In the laboratory, we may see discoloration of a red cell unit can turn dark or purple. Basically, heavy bacterial contamination tends to turn red cell units darker. Free hemoglobin can be there, a negative DAT by definition. Remember, this is not, this is not an immune process. And the gram stain and culture are kind of what we rely on. But remember, the gram stain is not a great test. About half the time, some people say a little more than half the time, is a truly contaminated unit going to give you a positive gram stain? And that's not good. That's not helpful. Um, if it's positive, great. If it's negative, don't rely on it at all. Culture is the proof. And the way we culture it is we take sample from the bag. Please take the sample from the bag because there have been very clear reports of, of instances where the bag is contaminated with a bug, but these little segments that are outside here are not contaminated with the bug. Um, so very important to, to do that culture. If, preferably, if we have a culture that shows the same bug in the bag and in the patient, and even better, in the donor as well, that's confirmatory proof that, that, that all three of those were related. We treat these patients just like we treat patients with septic shock. IV antibiotics that are presumptive. If the unit was a unit of red cells, you'll tend, to, you'll tend towards gram-negative coverage. If it's, gram, if it's uh, platelets, you tend towards gram-positive, but really you, you don't want to make too great a distinction until you get an identification, and you support them. Uh, we prevent these with careful history, and we do a lot of different stuff with our collection technique um, that may help. Leukocyte reduction filters, by the way, may help filter out some organisms. It's been shown to filter out Yersinia. Ultimately, pathogen reduction, uh, again, another topic for another day, may help us um, get rid of uh, the potential for bacterial contamination in the future. You should know that we do some things with platelets already to try and prevent these reactions. Um, most places will, will culture their platelets with, with uh, the Bacti Alert system that you see on the top left of this slide. Um, it's the same Bacti Alert that's used in microbiology. It, it, we culture platelets after 24 hours and see if there are any organisms there. Um, Obviously, we don't hold the platelets until the culture is final because we couldn't transfuse platelets at all then with their five-day shelf life. But we 
take a culture generally at 24 hours before the product is made available. Um, the EBDS system, the Electronic Bacterial Detection System, basically looks for it's it's a considered equivalent to the bacteria alert basically and it looks for oxygen consumption by organisms in this little pouch that you see here on the slide um, finally there are some methods that are now fda approved for testing platelets immediately prior to transfusion this the one that you see at the bottom is the virax test that i like to describe as the platelet pregnancy test because that's what it looks like to me you basically put some some uh, platelets in the or some of the liquid platelets in the center well there it diffuses out to either side you'll get positive reactions with gram positives on the left, gram negatives on the right. Uh, it, honest to God, it looks like a pregnancy test. And it is considered, it's considered useful because you can certainly get false negative tests. And that's been very clearly shown using either back T alert or the EBDS. Um, so this is a test that looks for platelets immediately before they're transfused. It's a transfusion service test rather than a blood center test. Not many places are using it, unfortunately, right now because it adds extra expense. But we don't have time to talk about it anymore. Let's move on and talk about transfusion-related acute lung injury. Trally is definitely still underdiagnosed, but it is the most common cause of fatality. You see that little flashlight there? That's what I call a flashlight in the eyes. If you haven't heard me say that before, that's something that you should automatically know. If someone asks you what the most common cause of transfusion-related fatality is, Trally should be reflex for you. It should pop out of your mouth right away. Okay, let's take a look at Trally and see how often it's happened since fiscal year 2007. It is declining. You can see that. Um, and in 2011, it was just barely above hemolytic transfusion reactions. If you combine ABO and non-ABO, there were nine and there were 10 trallies and a smaller number of some of the other reactions that you see there. Um, but let's move on and talk about trally and, and what the deal is with trally. Oh, by the way, if you look since 2005, you can see that trally, again, causes significantly more fatalities than any other transfusion reaction. And you can also see, looking at FDA data, that it's kind of across the board in terms of what products can cause trally. We typically think of trally as a plasma uh, issue, but because of some of the interventions that we'll talk about, actually the incidence of trally fatal trally from plasma transfusions is going down. Trally has, we've known about trally for a long time. Uh, it was first, it was first kind of described back in the 1950s, but better described by far in the mid 80s by Drs. Popovsky and Moore um, at Mayo. And basically now we have a fairly standard definition. Uh, a couple of different consensus conferences have given us this, and this is kind of the hybrid of that. It's basically defined as a new acute lung injury less than six hours after transfusion. An acute lung injury, or ALI, is defined as hypoxemia using a mathematical comparison of the amount of oxygen in your arteries to the amount of oxygen that you breathe. That's the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, or more easily as an oxygen saturation of less than 90% with bilateral chest x-ray infiltrates. Very important that you have the bilateral chest x-ray infiltrates and no other known risk factors for pulmonary edema. In order to definitively diagnose trally, that's what you need. And here's how trally looks. This is a patient um, that, that these slides were courteously provided to me by Dr. Chris Silliman. Um, a pre-transfusion chest x-ray on the left, post-transfusion chest x-ray on the right, and you can see bilateral, more basilar chest x-ray infiltrates. This unfortunately is an autopsy slide on the bottom left that shows significant pulmonary edema with a number of neutrophils in the, uh, in the edema fluid. More on that in a moment. These patients commonly present with fever and chills. Um, again, um, they, they often have hypertension that starts at the, at the beginning of the reaction, and then they drop down into hypotension eventually. Most commonly with plasma-rich products, as I said, and there's a wide clinical differential diagnosis that it includes especially transfusion-associated circulatory overload, or TACO. hate that acronym, but TACO, um, as well as ARDS and others. As far as the timing of the fever, tends to occur a little later than acute hemolysis, definitely later than sepsis. And let's just take a look at the acute, the acute febrile reactions and see what we can see. Remember, acute hemolysis on the top right uh, and septic reactions from red cells especially on the bottom right, they tend to present the earliest in transfusion, whereas febrile non-hemolytics tend to occur later and trally eh, somewhat more in the middle. Again, you can't use those to, to definitively diagnose anything, but that's just the trends. 
Okay, as far as trally, there are two main pathways that, to trally. The, there's the donor antibody pathway, uh, where you have a transfused antibody, and a two-event pathway that involves the patient being susceptible first and then getting a transfusion. We'll go over those in great detail in just a second, but you should be aware first that it's always important to define the villain of the piece. I love movies, and, and I love, uh, I, I tend to like villains. I think I, I take after my, or my daughter takes after me in that way. We tend to, we tend to gravitate towards the villains. Well, who's the villain of the piece? in in trally. Well, the villain is the neutrophil. The friendly appearing neutrophil, he doesn't look that friendly there, does he? The neutrophil that protects your body and defends you from invaders actually turns bad. It doesn't really turn bad. It's doing the stuff that it normally does. It's just doing it in a way that doesn't benefit us. Um, and how does it do that? Well, first, you should be aware that neutrophils, when they're going through the lungs, have to deform themselves quite dramatically. And they come in contact with pulmonary capillaries very, very tightly. Why do we care about that? What's so important about that in terms of trally? Well, you should be aware that over or about 30% of our total body neutrophils live in the lungs at all times. So there's a lot of opportunities for neutrophils to interact with the lung capillaries and lung tissues in general. Well, neutrophils themselves they do a couple things. Well, they tend to start off um, as quiescent, obviously. They're, they're normal. They're sitting there. And they're not doing much. However, if you start aggravating a neutrophil, such as a neutrophil seeing bacterial products or uh, different cytokines that you see there, different antibodies against neutrophils or antibodies against HLA class 1s, well, then you can start aggravating them to the point where they move forward through priming and all the way up to activation. Some other agents that you see there on the, on the right that activate cells. And activated neutrophils are neutrophils that are cranking out enzymes, toxic enzymes, reactive oxygen species, that's the ROS that you see there, and they cause damage. And that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to do that to fight off infection. However, things, come, things tend to be a bit of a problem in trally, and that's what we're going to talk about momentarily. Well, how does trally happen? The first and, and most commonly thought of pathway for trally is the so-called donor antibody pathway. That's a scenario where donor antibodies against either anti-HLA or anti-neutrophil, or, or donor antibodies against HLA or neutrophil antigens attack target white cells. Okay, so the donor is trans the antibody is coming in through the donor, through the donor plasma, and it attacks the recipient's white cells. Those antibody complex, antigen antibody complexes deposit in the lungs, uh, you get capillary damage and pulmonary edema. And, and here's, how this, here's, here's how this works, basically. You have a blood component that has antibodies. Those antibodies either being HLA or neutrophil antibodies, most commonly seen in donors who have been pregnant or transfused, and even primarily females that have been pregnant. So those antibodies come in, they interact with those neutrophils, the neutrophils go and they get activated, they get aggravated, they bind to endothelial cells, they get primed, they start, they start secreting their enzymes and reactive oxygen species, they damage the pulmonary endothelium, and you get pulmonary edema as a result. Very well proven, and that absolutely happens. However, what we discovered over the years is that doesn't actually explain all of the, the events of trally, all of the reactions with trally. We've certainly seen scenarios where patients have had trally without antibodies, or patients who received incompatible antibodies and didn't get trally. So my, a couple of my friends in Denver, um, Dr. Chris Silliman and Dr. Dan Ambruso, as well as a multitude of others, took a previously described possibility known as the two event or two hit pathway and started doing some work on it. And, and what we've seen is uh, an explanation that I think kind of brings it all together. The two event pathway basically su supposes that the first event is you have a patient who has some pre-existing bad condition, sepsis, surgery, massive transfusion, basically something that activates their endothelial cells and their neutrophils. It gets those neutrophils on the edge of starting to be uh, activated and starting to crank out those enzymes and reactive oxygen species. And then the second event occurs, which is blood transfusion. And blood, as you know, once it's stored, it's not, it doesn't stay the same as the day that it was collected, and stuff accumulates in it. That stuff includes things like stored lipids and soluble CD40 ligand and things like that that basically collectively are called biological response modifiers. Those together can stimulate primed neutrophils. And in addition, what we've discovered is that antibodies, the same antibodies that we talked about in the donor antibody pathway, can do the same thing. So here's how that looks. Um, the patient has a particular clinical condition that 
again, it starts getting those neutrophils aggregated. So they tend to, they, they start binding to the pulmonary endothelium, they start hanging around the endothelium. Then you get the second event or the second hit, which is either transfused antibodies, the same kind of antibodies we talked about before, or transfused biological response modifiers, the storage products that occur in blood, and those, that second hit just basically pushes the neutrophils over the edge. They crank out cytokines, they cause damage. I'm sorry, they crank out reactive oxygen species and enzymes, they cause damage, and we end up in a scenario where you have pulmonary edema. So I think we have a reasonable explanation for why trally occurs, but the problem with trally is that proving it is really hard. Um, if you're out in a place where you're not able to do a whole lot of advanced testing, it can be really hard to prove trally. It's difficult, it's time consuming, uh, finding the antibodies in the donors can be hard, ruling out other stuff is really hard. Basically you often end up in a situation with a patient with a wet chest x-ray, low oxygen saturation, and if you're going to diagnose trally, they really need to have no signs of congestive heart failure. That's often an issue. Sometimes BNP levels can help. We'll talk about BNP in just a moment. Fundamentally, we end up giving them respiratory support. They have a decent number of them die, unfortunately, but 80% of them have a rapid recovery. We prevent them. Uh, historically, we've, we've tried to prevent them because, as I said before, the antibodies tend to occur in females who have been pregnant. We have moved more in the direction of a all or predominantly male plasma supply in the United States and elsewhere, and we're trying to move in that direction with platelets as well. Some people are moving, are trying to, because platelets are more difficult to do all male, they're moving in the direction of screening females who have been pregnant to look for antibodies, and, and if they are negative, to allow them to donate again. ABB is deeply involved in this, and they really want us to come up with different ways to prevent trally, and we're working on them. Unfortunately, you should realize that those things that I just described do absolutely nothing to prevent the trally that happens from the two hit model, the, in particular with biological response modifiers, which some people say are 20% or more of trally reactions. Bottom line, the only sure way to avoid trally, avoid transfusion altogether. Okay, so the, I know that took a while, but certainly the acute febrile reactions are, uh, have a, they have a ton of details and we had to take the time to go through that. I hope you're still with me. We're gonna now hit the acute afebrile transfusion reactions and we're not gonna talk about all of these. We'll start with the, the allergic reactions, in particular, the mild allergic reactions. They have about a one to 3% incidence. They are very, very common. Just local hives, uh, local urticaria, uh, most common presentation. Occasionally you'll see people with angioedema more swelling around the, uh, the, the, the lips and the eyes, but most commonly just simple hives. It's a type 1 IgE mediated hypersensitivity that Benadryl works very well to prevent and treat. Um, with the same discussion that we talked about before, Benadryl may not be the best idea to give to someone routinely to prevent, but it certainly works to treat. Um, and the flashlight in the eyes, though I didn't put it here, is that this is the only reaction that when it occurs, a patient can be treated with Benadryl. If the hive's clear, you can go ahead and restart the transfusion. That is the only one, in my opinion. And here's just a look at some hives, um, and the, the image on the right shows that this is IgE-mediated with antigens binding to IgE antibodies on mast cells and the secretion of substances that cause hives, essentially. Severe allergic reactions, on the other hand, are the opposite end of the spectrum. They've been defined, well, the terminology is a little weird sometimes. Anaphylactic reactions specifically are allergic reactions that result in shock and hypotension. Anaphylactoid reactions have been used for a wide variety of things, and you see some of them here on the slide. Some say for milder anaphylactic, whatever that means. Other people say that, uh, that an anaphylactoid is the type of reaction you see in patients with angiotensin converting enzyme, that are taking angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Bottom line, it's a very loose distinction and I would recommend that you not really use it, anaphylactic versus anaphylactoid. I find it better to just call them all severe allergic reactions and go from there. It's basically the extreme opposite end of an urticarial reaction. Classically, these patients present with an acute crash that I, uh, that I described to you before. They get acute hypotension, abdominal distress, a systemic crash very early in the transfusion, sometimes in the first few drops, and they almost always have skin findings. That's important for you to remember. This is just a big complicated diagram that shows that these patients get vasodilation, so they get hypotension, they get bronchoconstriction, so they get significant amounts of, of respiratory issues, but in addition, they almost always have some skin findings. Well, the classic thing, the flashlight in the eyes that you should remember about uh, severe allergic reactions is IgA deficiency. Um, 
IgA deficiency is a scenario where someone lacks the IgA antibody. Just in case you don't remember, Ig. Um, IgM is a pentamer, IgG is a monomer, IgA sits down here and lives in secretions. It's a, it's a dimer typically joined by a secretory component. And basically it's fairly common for people to have low levels of IgA, but it's pretty uncommon that for them to have basically no IgA below 0. Or 0 0.05 milligrams per deciliter. In those patients, they can develop an antibody, which actually is an IgE, and when they are exposed to IgA again, they can get anaphylaxis fairly quickly. The problem with that, unfortunately, is that it's really hard to detect the anti-IgA. The anti-IgA that we detect in laboratories is the IgG version and doesn't necessarily correlate to IgE. And again, bottom line is that very few patients who have a severe allergic reaction actually have anti-IgA. We'll come back to that in a second. There are other se severe allergies that can cause the same type of reaction, haptoglobin being fairly common among, haptoglobin deficiency, I should say, being fairly common among Asians, but some weird things like latex and drug allergies, foods eaten by donors. I hate that one. That's so weird. Some uh, A scenario where a donor ate peanuts and his plasma was transfused to a, a, a child who had a, a severe peanut allergy and the child had an anaphylactic-like reaction. That's a scary one and almost, almost impossible to predict or prevent. Bottom line, most of these reactions, most severe allergic reactions, end up in a situation where we do not have any explanation for them. The differential diagnosis is wide. I've already talked about the acute crash differential with acute hemolytic reactions that tend to be febrile and a little bit later, septic reactions that are wildly febrile and about the same time. Uh, the handout talks about acute hypotension, but remember there can be other stuff that can give you same, the same kind of findings um, as a result uh, th that aren't related, I should say, to the transfusion. Okay, so how do you handle these? Well, basically, if you have someone that presents with an acute or severe uh, allergic reaction, you should consider IgA deficiency and possibly haptoglobin deficiency if you if the patient is Asian or if you're, uh, it, 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 no, primarily if the patient's Asian because that's the, that's where it's predominantly found. Bottom line, you should test the patient's pre-transfusion sample and test that pre-transfusion sample for IgA. You can screen, do a screen for the IgA level, generally with nephilometry. It's pretty easy to do. Um, if the patient's IgA level is super, super low, only then would I do an anti-IgA test. Some people just go straight and do the anti-IgA, but I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense. I agree with some of the recommendations that have been made. It's easy to do an IgA level pre-transfusion. Remember, you have to do a pre-transfusion sample. If you find that they have basically absent IgA, yeah, then proceed with the workup. But honestly, most of these don't have that. It's very uncommon to find someone with an acute, acute uh, severe allergic reaction that actually has IgA deficiency. Bottom line, these patients need epinephrine and they need it right away. I've said a lot of bottom line this podcast. I apologize for that. They need epinephrine. They need it right away. It can be given intravenously, but subcutaneous or IM is generally reasonable. And they probably will also need a bronchodilator dilator to open up their lungs. If you prove IgA deficiency um, in a patient who has a severe allergic reaction or is, uh, yeah, severe allergic reaction, then they probably do need quote unquote IgA deficient products, which usually means that you get products from IgA deficient donors and, and blood centers have those. They're not necessarily readily available, but they can get a hold of them. Um, the classic thing that we can do is we can wash red cells with at least two liters of saline. We can wash platelets, though those don't work as well. And potentially the patient can donate their own blood for future elective procedures. Bottom line, oh, I said it again, if the patient is not IgA deficient, then a combination of washed or autologous options may be necessary. Obviously, you're not going to give IgA deficient products who's, to a patient who's not IgA deficient. That just doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's turn the page and talk about a couple of weird ones. Your handout talks about the acute hypotensive reaction, which some people call anaphylactoid reactions. Basically, these are very short temporary temporary reactions associated with bradykinin um, generation from leukocyte reduction filters, certain varieties, and patients on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. ACE inhibitors basically inhibit the breakdown of bradykinin, so you can end up with acute hypotension. Not common, not a diagnosis you'll make very often. Even less common is transfusion-associated dyspnea. CDC defines this as simply a diagnosis of exclusion in a patient who has significant respiratory findings, 
but has had trolley taco and allergy ruled out. You're not going to find it all that often. So let's move on and let's talk about taco. I mentioned this before. This is not one of my favorite ac acronyms. TACO stands for Transfusion Associated Circulatory Overload, and I find it impossible to talk to a clinician about this and say, well, I think your patient had TACO, because they look at me like I'm nuts. But anyway, TACO is basically acute congestive heart failure due to transfusion. These patients have a, they look like patients in CHF. They have dyspnea, orthopnea, rails, hypoxia, and look those up if you're not familiar with those terms. Systolic hypertension, JVD stands for jugular venous distension. Here's a picture of it. You can see that large dilated vessel in this patient's neck. Um, they have headache. They're usually afebrile, though they can sometimes have a temperature increase. This is a patient with congestive heart failure, uh, uh, secondary to transfusion. They have bibasilar infiltrates. The cardiac silhouette, in other words, the heart appears wider. That may be the only distinction from transfusion-related acute lung injury. Patients who are at risk for TACO including, include patients that already have CHF, obviously, patients already in failure, patients who are very young or especially very old. It's been shown that 85% of patients in some series uh, that have TACO are over 60 years old. Patients with renal failure and chronic compensated anemias because of their underlying volume issues. The differential for trally, for TACO is primarily trally, honestly, but you can also, it can also be confused with allergic or anaphylactic reactions or something coincidental, but we need to talk about the distinction with trally real quickly. It can be really, really hard. Um, often we just, dis we just distinguish them by the fact that, oh, the, it, the patient looked volume overloaded, it got diuretics, and it worked, so that's probably TACO rather than trally. I know that's not scientific, but functionally, that's how it often happens. Fever in trally, no fever in taco. Hypotension in trally, usually hypertension in taco. Some people use the, the BNP or brain natriuretic pep peptide levels, which should be elevated in taco. And some people use the ratio that you see there on the slide. That's not something I typically use. And obviously, if you identify the antibodies that we've described before, it's more likely trally than TACO. But again, it can be really, really hard. These patients are treated just like patients with, with CHF. They, you discontinue the transfusion, sit the patient up, give them diuretics and oxygen, and long-term, to prevent them, you, you do slower transfusions, you split the units into smaller volumes, um, and, and, or possibly volume reduce the, the, the products to give them a smaller volume. Okay. Moving on, we're, uh, see that went faster, didn't it? Now let's talk about the delayed febrile transfusion reactions. There's a couple of them that we need to hit. The first one is the delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. It's really important. Delayed hemolytic reactions defined as hemolysis occurring at least 24 hours, that's the delayed reaction, right, to less than 28 days after transfusion, according to the CDC. Basically, the, most of these occur as a result of an antibody that we can't see. It's the, the, an antibody that's been formed in the past, but it has declined to the level that we can't detect it anymore. The patient is re-exposed, and the antibody comes flying back. That's an anamnestic reaction. I'll show that to you in a moment. Kid, Duffy, and Kell are the most common blood groups associated with it. Occasionally, you can see primary responses that I'll show you in a minute, but not very often. Here's how it works. Basically, a patient um, gets a transfusion. Let's just imagine this patient is negative for the JKA or Kid A antigen. They happen to get a transfusion of Kid A positive cells, which is completely unavoidable. It certainly can happen. Um, they get a transfusion of Kid A positive cells. They develop an anti-JKA. Okay. Well, what happens with anti-JKA over the course of time is that it's actually fairly famous for just kind of disappearing and fading away. So that the next time the patient gets a transfusion, potentially years down the line, or even months down the line, or even potentially weeks down the line, they may be tested and f have no detectable antibody. You see that that yellow box in the middle is still blank. So they have no detectable antibody, and they get a transfusion again of JKA positive cells, because why not? We wouldn't be testing for JKA on the red cells because we don't know that the patient has an antibody. But this exposure leads to an anamnestic response where the antibody comes flying back much stronger than it was before. The red, sorry, the red cells, circulating red cells are destroyed uh, by that, by that anti-JKA. Classic anam anamnestic response. A primary response, on the other hand, can happen, it doesn't happen very often, where that first transfusion leads to such rapid formation of anti-JKA that it destroys the still circulating initial, initially um, antibody-inducing red cells. Again, not all that often, much more commonly anamnestic. 
Most of these reactions are extravascular. In, by comparison, remember acute hemolytic reactions, we were primarily talking intravascular with complement fixation, IgM, blowing the red cells apart right where they are. Except the, the kid antibodies, kid antibodies are the exception to this. Kid antibodies actually have a decent tendency to do intravascular hemolysis, but most of the other ones that we talked about typically give you extravascular hemolysis. The signs and symptoms, often none whatsoever. In fact, they, these, are, these are commonly found coincidentally when a patient presents with fever and anemia of unknown origin or unexplained jaundice or scleral icterus. You see this patient with bright yellow eyes. When we look at these patients in the laboratory, uh, the, their serum has that yellow color. It's icteric. Um, they will have a positive DAT, which is commonly described as mixed field. That's the MF that you see there. It's not the other MF. It's that MF. And if you look on the, the far right of the, the diagram, this is a mixed field reaction in gel. Basically, some of the cells are agglutinating at the top, um, whereas some of the cells are not agglutinating at the bottom of that particular gel well. Um, that basically indicates that the incompatible cells are agglutinating, the patient's own cells are not agglutinating. And again, they have the findings that you would expect in patients with hemolysis. Treatment may not be required at all, if, but if it is severe, as sometimes happens with kid antibodies, you treat them just like an acute hemolytic reaction with volume and pressure support. Uh, finally, it's important to distinguish between the delayed hemolytic reaction that we're talking about now with the delayed serologic transfusion reaction that is in the that is later in the in the discussion that we're not going to actually we're not going to hit it beyond this so pay attention right now basically if you have that same presentation a new antibody newly discovered antibody but you have no evidence of hemolysis whatsoever the cdc and typically most people define that as a delayed serologic transfusion reaction there is disagreement on that some people will say if the patient doesn't have clinical symptoms then they call it delayed serologic i personally don't practice that way but some people do but remember, you should only call, according to the CDC, a delayed serologic transfusion reaction after you've completely ruled out hemolysis in a patient with a new antibody. Okay, um, moving on to the another delayed febrile transfusion reaction, we need to talk about transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease. It is a very rare, thankfully, attack on host tissues by transfused T lymphocytes that almost always kills people. It's something you never want to diagnose. It's something you always want to prevent. And here's how it works. Basically, when someone gets a transfusion from someone who is not HLA identical to them, in other words, they share, they have different HLA antigens on their surface, uh, on their cell surfaces, then the transfused white cells, particularly the transfused T lymphocytes, are gonna come in and try and attack those host tissues. The host HLA antigens, um, in particular, the skin, the liver, the GI tract, the mucous membranes, and the bone marrow will get attacked by T lymphocytes that you see there um, that, that try to mount an immune response against what those transfused white cells see as foreign. Now, fortunately, um, most, in most situations, patients are able to make a counterattack. And the counterattack simply means that the patient's intact immune system, in particular CD8 and NK cells, are able to go in, see those foreign, recently transfused white cells, and neutralize them to the point that that initial attack, as a result of the counterattack, doesn't give you any problems. Well, TAGVHD, on the other hand, is a scenario where something goes wrong in that counterattack. What would happen, for example, if the scenario on the right happens where the patient is immunosuppressed and all those lovely white cells, all those lovely CD8 cells that would normally be counterattacking, uh, they're just not working right. What would happen then? Or what would happen in the scenario on the right if the patient were lymphopenic? Instead of a normal amount of T lymphocytes, suddenly this patient doesn't have nearly enough. In that scenario, then that initial attack on the, white cell, on the HLA antigens, on the tissues that you see on the bottom of the slide, can be magnified to where we get dramatic damage to all those tissues and transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease. The big deal in TAGVHD, as you can see from the underlying thing, is the bone marrow, and, and let's talk about that. So the sequence, we've already summarized it, viable active T lymphocytes transfused. We don't know the minimum threshold. Um, it, that's why leukocyte reduction doesn't work to prevent them, because we don't know how much we have to reduce. 
HLA incompatibility is present between between host and recipient, or sorry, between uh, the transfused cells and the recipient, I should say. The host, the, the patient, cannot respond for some reason, and the patient presents seven to 10 days later with fever, a rash, mucositis, hepatitis, and unfortunately, the worst deal is that the marrow gets wiped out, they get pancytopenic, and they usually die with overwhelming infections. Well, how do we prevent this? Well, this should be fairly obvious, right? If the problem is the transfused white cells, then in patients who are at risk for transfusion-associated GVHD, we need to do something to those white cells. And what we do is we nuke them. We hit them with irradiation, either from gamma irradiation or X-ray irradiation, basically 2,500 centigrade targeted to the center of the bag and at least 1,500 centigrade to all parts of the bag. And we neutralize those white cells so that they can't mount that initial attack. Well, who needs, who needs irradiation? Well, some people go, in my opinion, a little overboard and irradiate blood to everyone. Um, I actually happen to work at a facility that does that, and that's okay. It certainly is not, that's not a, a big issue, but the patients who definitely need uh, irradiated products include patients that are immunosuppressed with T-cell defects, including drugs like fludarabine, stem cell and marrow transplant patients, because they are so significantly uh, cytopenic, will, will need irradiated products. Pa same thing with aplastic anemia patients. Babies, in particular premature babies and intrauterine transfusions, because their, their uh, cellular immune system is not developed enough to counterattack. Hematologic malignancies, most patients with hematologic, hematologic malignancies, especially Hodgkin's disease, will get irradiated products. Granulocytes, because of, the, um, because of the patients who generally need granulocytes are already significantly immunosuppressed, patients who are getting granulocyte transfusions should get irradiated products. And the first degree relative thing, this is something that confuses people. So I wanna take just a minute to talk about why patients who get blood from a first degree relative or HLA matched or HLA, something that's close to you HLA wise, why should those products be irradiated? Well, let's look at a, a, a potential scenario that could occur in or out of families, but this is a, a normal scenario where, for example, a donor uh, shares one HLA haplotype, that A2B7 haplotype with a recipient. Um, if you don't know what haplotype is, take pause this for a second and look that up on the, in the glossary on the Blood Bank Guy website. I'll wait here for you. Um, okay, so as a result of th this person, this donor and recipient, they share one haplotype, but the other haplotype is different. The transfused cells are going to go in and try and attack the recipient's tissues, but the recipient's white cells are going to see that transfused white cell, notice the A9B12 and say, hey, that's not me, counterattack, no problem. That's normal, that's what, no that's what normally happens in transfusion. However, if we have a scenario where the donor is HLA homozygous for A2B7 and happens to share one of those haplotypes with the recipient, that A2B7, then that is known as a one-way HLA match. And in the one-way HLA match, you can have a scenario where graft-versus-host disease, transfusion-associated version, can occur regardless of whether the recipient is immunocompetent or immunosuppressed. And here's how it works. That donor looks and sees the A11B12 on the bottom right and says, hey, that's not me, and goes to try and mount an attack. However, the recipient looks at those transfused white cells and all he sees is A2B7 says, ah, that's me, turns its back on it, and you have a perfect setup for transfusion-associated GVHD. So that's why blood from first-degree relatives or HLA match should be irradiated, because that type of one-way HLA match is much more likely to occur in family members. Okay, so who's not at risk? Who doesn't need irradiated products? Well, organ transplant recipients, term neonates because they're prob they probably have enough cellular immunity, um, and AIDS patients. Remember, the the counterattack is mounted by CD8 cells, and since CD8 cells are preserved until late in the disease in HIV in, in AIDS, I should say. They probably don't, those patients probably don't need irradiated blood. To tell you the truth, if people ask in any of those situations, I go ahead and give it to them. It's, that's not a problem to me. And patients who receive previously frozen plasma products in particular, like FFP and cryo, uh, because the white cells are damaged in the process, generally don't need irradiation. However, if a patient receives a product that has been cryopreserved, like a frozen uh, glycerolized unit of red cells, the white cells can be viable, and if they are at risk, they should be irradiated. A couple of miscellaneous things. Uh, irradiation doesn't work to prevent CMV. That doesn't work at all. Leukocyte reduction is what you need for that, or CMV seronegative products. You should not irradiate stem cell infusions. 
think about that one for a second. It doesn't make any sense to irradiate a product that's supposed to repopulate the marrow. Um, and it's not interchangeable with leukocyte reduction. We do it for totally different reasons. Finally, uh, the maximum amount of shelf life for a product that's been irradiated is 28 days post irradiation or the regular expiration date, whichever happens to come first. All right, we are on to the very last category, which is the delayed afebrile transfusion reactions. And I have very good news for you. I'm only gonna talk about one of these three. We've already talked about the delayed serologic reaction. I am gonna talk about PTP or post-transfusion purpura. The handout goes over iron overload. Let's talk about PTP. PTP is a, is, uh, a reaction that is also rare and is probably declining for a, a variety of reasons. Fundamentally, PTP is antibody-mediated platelet destruction after transfusion. It occurs about 10 days after the transfusion, usually, strangely, from what we'll talk about in a minute, from a transfusion of red cells more commonly than a transfusion of platelets. And these patients prevent, present with a severe thrombocytopenia, their platelet counts generally less than 10,000, with a wet purpura, meaning they're oozing from, from mucosal surfaces and raw surfaces. It can, they can have up to a 12% mortality with intracranial hemorrhage, but that today typically does not occur. PTP is much more common in females than males in a five to one ratio, especially multiparous females, females who have had babies because the antibodies that we're gonna talk about require pregnancy or transfusion to, or exposure in order to occur. Most cases of PTP are associated with a, an antibody against a particularly common platelet antigen known as HPA1A or PLA1 historically. Patients who lack HPA1A and are exposed through pregnancy or transfusion can develop an antibody against that antigen that causes the problem. Before we talk about that, let me just make sure you know it can be really hard to diagnose PTP. You see the alphabet soup of acronyms down there at the bottom of abbreviations, I should say, TTP, ITP, DIC, HIT. Uh, all those things can be confused with, with PTP. And it's, uh, it's harder if the patient is already thrombocytopenic at the time of the, of the red cell transfusion. Uh, there's a lot more to that, but we don't have time to do it. But let's talk about how PTP normally does occur. You have a patient who's HPA1A negative, and as a result of either pregnancy or transfusion, they see platelets that are HPA1A positive. As a result of this initial exposure, they develop an anti-HPA1A antibody. Okay, great. Well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is the next time they're exposed to uh, HPA1A, either through a platelet or red cell transfusion in this setting of PTP, um, a couple of weird things happen. The antibody, uh, the antibody which is already there can get stronger and that antibody does a couple of things. That antibody, as you would expect, is gonna destroy all of the transfused or nearly all of the transfused HPA1A positive platelets and that just makes sense. But what's weird is that the antibody also destroys the patient's own HPA1A negative platelets. So why on earth does that happen? Well, clearly that's the reason that these patients present with such a low count. They're not only transfusing the platelets that they see from someone else, they're also destroying their own platelets. There have been at least three different main theories described as to why this happens, uh, including um, the, the, the antigen is soluble and it adsorbs onto the surface, the antigen antibody complex go onto the surface, and those all may, be, may have some degree of truth, but it's probably because the anti-HPA1A antibody is not as specific as we thought, and it has a component uh, of an autoantibody. In other words, it reacts against not only HPA1A positive cells, but also against the patient's own cells, just as a result of the, the way the antibody is and the way the antibody reacts. Uh, these, these patients are primarily in 2012 treated with IV in, uh, intravenous immunoglobulin, I, IVIG, it's first line therapy. Generally, we only use plasma exchange if IVIG fails. Um, as I mentioned before, about 12% of patients have intracranial hemorrhage and die. Uh, that's the unfortunate few, but it's very rare for patients with diagnosed and treated PTP to die. Obviously, giving the patient more platelets isn't the greatest idea because you're just gonna stimulate additional antibody formation. Um, bottom line, if these, pa uh, one last time, bottom line, <laughs> if these patients need platelets in the future, they should be antigen matched. Okay, 
we have covered a whole lot in an, about an hour and 10 minutes. I thank you so much for hanging out with me for this podcast. Um, we've, we've talked about a lot. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me through the website. Um, I'm, as always, incredibly grateful for you hanging out with me uh, during this time. I hope that you all have a, a wonderful and blessed new year. And thanks again. We'll see you the next time.